Okay, so I'm going to talk today about a project that we recently finished at the University of Utah using Cisco IPSK and user-defined networking with Splash Access and ICE. And we're really excited about this project. Now that it's finally in place, it's solving problems that we've had really for years and years. And um, that's why we wanted to share it, just in case others maybe have some of the same uh, problems. But it's been spe uh, specifically beneficial in our student housing environment. We have about 40 student housing buildings. And one of the things that they're always after is this home-like experience. So we finally achieved the home-like Wi-Fi experience within the enterprise architecture. And what I mean by that is that we didn't have to do anything crazy like uh, flatten our architecture and make one VLAN or put everything on a PSK, right? We have lots of devices that are laptops and phones and they do dot one X and we have other devices that don't and they go on the IPSK. So we did everything within the confines of an existing enterprise architecture. And so the benefit is that today users can now limit network discovery and MDNS to only their personal devices. A user can allow a friend, for example, a roommate, to control their smart TV in their room by registering their device. That's in the Splash Access portal. We also make it so devices on the enterprise WLAN can discover MDNS devices on the IPSK WLAN using the MDNS gateway. And I know that's a bad word for a lot of you, but just hear me out. <laughs> We're also providing MDNS capabilities only to those who need it and not to those that are not interested in that MDNS traffic that causes so many performance problems for all of our controllers. So in addition to that, we already had an IPSK homegrown portal and we were able to upgrade that to allow new features that were provided in the Splash Access portal for our users. So one statistic before I talk about how we did this, I just wanted to share, this is a 2022 statistic, I'm sure it, the numbers are uh, higher now, but it said that 76% of homes have smart TVs in them. And about 20% of homes have other streaming devices, smart bulbs, smart speakers, things like that. So this is clearly a use case that users are familiar with and they expect it when they're in housing. And not only that, but they ex they're comfortable uh, interacting with smart TVs and smart devices at home using their phones, using MDNS, and they're comfortable doing that even in offices and conference rooms where they have these smart TVs. So they expect that. And using your existing architecture and not doing anything special makes it so that we can deploy that service anywhere where people like that home-like expect or want that home-like user experience. So this is how it works. We're using Splash Access. It's a cloud-based portal. They're a Cisco Meraki um, partner. That's up here in the, the green cloud. And the first step is that the users log into this portal and register their MAC address, and they, see, they can see in the portal their IPSK if they're using a low-capability IoT device. This uses SAML authentication to the University of Utah, and Splash Access has an API into ICE that pushes a unique private UDM ID to the device, for, and it's the same UDN ID for each of the user's devices. So you can see that this user over on the left has <coughs> the red UDN IDs, and he's got one of these that's applied to, for example, his MacBook Pro on the 802.1x network, and also the same UDN ID applied to, for example, um, an Apple TV on the IPSK network. And this, what happens is at authentication time, Radius returns these private UDN IDs to the wireless controller, and the wireless controller contains the multicast so that he only sees his devices, and the user below, for example, with the blue UDN IDs, she only sees her devices. <clears throat> so this has not just convenience benefits, but also security benefits um, for the users. So um, what does the experience look like for the users? This is the Splash, Splash Access portal. Um, and you can see that there's a, <clears throat> in the middle of the page, they can reveal the Wi-Fi password. They can generate a new password. So they have that control. The administrator, however, has the control on the, on the length and the complexity of the passwords. So you can decide how uh, secure to make that. The users are able to um, give descriptions to their devices 
Uh, they can update those at any time. They can delete them. They can add new ones. And one thing that they can do that we couldn't do with our old setup is that they can check to verify that if a device has uh, gone inactive, it hasn't uh, been purged from the ICE database by hitting the, the yellow check button. So this works for users with personal devices, and it also works for users that manage lots of uh, low-capability IoT devices. <clears throat> so, for example, a manager of a smart TVs can come into the portal, and up at the top, there's a, big, uh, there's a yellow button that allows them to import in bulk. And all of these devices could use the same IPSK. Here's an example of the mo how it looks on a mobile device. It's very simple, easy to work with, um, and, we, and we like it. Splash Access did a great job with that. So you might be wondering what's required to pull this off. So you have to have Cisco 9800 series wireless LAN controllers, Cisco Catalyst 3800 series um, APs or above, Cisco ICE 3.1 uh, with PX Grid, and a Splash Access account. We also use test devices like Roku Smart TVs, Android TVs, Apple TVs, and Chromecast to do our testing. So there's a few components involved, but honestly, it's really simple uh, once this is set up to um, tie users to uh, groups of devices in a portal and then apply a policy. So here's an example of this. On the top is the Splash Access uh, user interface, and you can see the AD group name here is UTV, and the endpoint identity group has been ingested via API from ICE. So there's an API My Devices identity group, and then down below, I just reference in ICE the API My Devices identity group, and I return over on the right here the UDN attribute. So this rule on top is for my IPSK network, and then the policy below is for my .1x network. So I'm returning the UDN attribute for both of those. So then you can, this is an example of the UDN authorization profile that gets returned in ICE. You can see there are multiple variables there. The important one is the private group ID, uh, 23, which gets assigned to both of my devices, and that's how the controller knows to allow multicast to those devices, but not the others. Um, there's also a few things to, con a, a couple of things to configure in, in Splash Access in, and then also on PX Grid. In Splash Access, you need to put the public IP address of your ICE server and then the IP addresses, and they can be RFC 1918 for your controllers and also the, the WLANs that will participate in UDN. Once you have that defined, you just go into PX Grid and there will be a Splash Access UDN account that you just accept and allow. Finally, on the controller, there's um, about four configuration items. You just need to enable MDNS globally, define an MDNS service list, um, enable the MDNS policy, prof uh, sorry, enable MDNS on the policy profile, and then enable gateway mode, and enable UDN on the WLAN. So along the way, we learned a couple of lessons. Um, not all were good lessons. Um, so there is re good reason to, to fear MDNS and, and be aware of the problems it can cause. Well, we were, the first thing that happens when you enable UDN is all MDNS traffic stops. So one thing we thought about is, well, what if we had, a, for a transition period, we assigned everybody the same UDN ID so that for, until people got accustomed to our new portal, they were able to, um, MDNS would continue to work. So we assigned everybody the same UDN ID, and we immediately saw that these WNCD processes on the controller, the wireless network controller daemon processes, were up in the 90s and 80 percent. And then after that, in our syslogs, we could see that users were getting throttled. So that was a very bad thing. The good news is we were able to quickly disable that policy and say, we're not going to do this in transition. We're just going to quickly introduce the, we're going to speed the introduction to the, to the portal. <laughs> um, the other thing we learned is about pruning the MDNS list. We started with a, um, a, a long MDNS list, and we, we had to uh, prune it down. And uh, I'm going to skip a couple, couple other things because we're short on time. So what's next? We have a couple of feature requests into um, Cisco to make it better, to make UDN work with LSS, um, to allow querying of splash access for groups so we don't have to type MAC addresses. So you can just uh, query your name and pull all your devices in. And then in the future, we think this is going to work great if and when we might migrate to Meraki because Splash Access is a Meraki partner and already does IPSK on Meraki devices. 
And then finally, our Wired team is uh, finding out that this works really good with their NAC project for registering Mac uh, devices that can't do 802.1x for Mac auth, auth bypass. And that's what I had today, so thank you.